Assalamu alaikum. We're very happy and very pleased to be hosting this interview with Dr. Asfar Qadir. Dr. Asfar Qadir is a Pakistani mathematician and a prominent cosmologist specialized in mathematical physics and physical cosmology. He is considered as one of the top mathematicians in the country and is currently the chairman of mathematics department and the director of the School of Natural Sciences at the Nast University. Assalamu alaikum, sir. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us what sparked your interest in physics and math. Um, just give a little bit of an introduction. Uh, it was basically my father who engendered my interest in mathematics and physics. He was a lawyer, but he had done his BA in physics and mathematics from Government College Lahore, and he talked about it and I got interested and excited with physics and he talked to me particularly about relativity and I got particularly interested in relativity and so that very clearly is where it all starts. Then of course there's a matter of personal interests and my interest had always been with numbers. Again that's my father started at the age of less than two in teaching me about numbers and counting and it was a game and so I got interested in numbers and then in mathematics more generally throughout it's my father guiding the development. That's, that's brilliant. So you had a great grooming and, and it really helped you with your... Yes, well it has been the motivating uh, force throughout. But you had the chance to work with great physicists and mathematicians, Abdus Salam and Dr. Riyazuddin. So how do you view the current uh, elite, physics elite in Pakistan and around the world? Well, we haven't developed our talent well enough, obviously. Salam rose in Pakistan not because of anything that Pakistan did. It wasn't because of the school in Jhang, it was despite the school in Jhang that he developed. If you hear his interviews and his talks about it, when he talks of how they were taught about electricity and the teacher said that there's this other force of electricity which lives in Lahore but is not to be found in Jhang. Now that was the level at which he was going to be taught throughout. And this is at a higher level of uh, teaching. Despite that, he comes out and that is Salam, it isn't his school. His father concentrated on religious teaching. He memorized the Quran at a very early age. And he says, Salam said, that that helped him uh, in his after words all his career because he could remember things right away. He, he developed a very good memory. Now that was the, the capability of Salam and we haven't had anybody capable like that. Riyazuddin was a student of Salam and he was brilliant, extremely capable, but the question would arise whether he would have being what he was without Salam. Salam would have been what he was without anybody because he was Salam. But Riyazuddin developed because of Salam. Now there are two identical twins, Riyazuddin and Riyazuddin. But there's no doubt in anybody's mind, including Riyazuddin's, that Riyazuddin was by far superior to the physicist. And as generally depth of understanding capability, he became a very close friend of mine and I, I don't have any reservations on the level that he was. There was a person who had been with him at college, uh, uh, the name was uh, uh, Bhakti who was a famous physicist in America and was very well known 
But he regarded Riaz as undoubtedly superior and Riaz stayed in Pakistan. He stayed in Pakistan because Salam wanted him to stay in Pakistan and develop Pakistan physics. For Riaz also, then Salam students, Murtaza, Arif Zaman, Razmi, Kamaluddin, they were the were people who set up the physics department here. And that's what set up physics in Pakistan. So the contribution is immense. Riyazuddin was the founder director. This department should be the Riyazuddin Department of Physics. Oh, yes. It should have that name to it. Uh, people haven't given it the name that it deserves. You yourself came repeatedly to Pakistan. You served in GIK, in Qadiazm, now in Nas. Well, I came first to what was then Islamabad University. Yes. Because of uh, three people at Khaidazm University. I had seen their papers. Riyazuddin, Fayyazuddin, Munir Rashid. Munir Rashid was in the mathematics department. And Khaidazm University owes an enormous debt to all of them. Riyazuddin in particular. But then Munir Rashid for getting things going in mathematics for some time. And then uh, made it possible for this to follow. So I would certainly count those two as having made a bigger contribution. For Yazuddin, because despite his tremendous capability, it's overshadowed by Yazuddin. Yes, of course. So, the question is um, what is the philosophy of science? What, can it hope at reaching the ultimate truth? And another question, which is which is basically an extension of this one, is that is there such a thing as secular knowledge and religious knowledge, or or, or is ilm just ilm, a pursuit of the truth, the haq? My own view, and let me stress that's my own view, very much is that knowledge is knowledge, and even the divisions of physics, mathematics, and economics, and whatever, are arbitrary divisions. Knowledge as a whole is what one really is going to talk about. Secular knowledge and religious knowledge don't make good sense to me. It's, anything. it's all knowledge is what there is about whatever there is, and that is knowledge. So that division seems particularly arbitrary. Knowledge about a given religion, I can understand. But let me just say with my own philosophy, very much my own, I, like Penrose has talked of three words, I've talked of three words. There's the world that the child sees at the beginning, which I call the world of I want, which is whatever can be bad. The child sees the world revolving around him. That's all that there is. As the child grows up, it ceases to be the world of I want because I can't get what I want. There will be things that are not available. He has to learn. And the, the way I put it was that I started by saying, the, the world is about me. It's not about you or her or him or him. It's about me. That's what the whole world says. And now you think about that. The whole world says, not that it's about me. It's about you. It's me. It's about me. That realization is what's called growing up. That it is more than just to the individual. Then if it is the world, or as it is, you have to get used to whatever there is around. You have to see what you can get, not what you ideally want, but what will be available. You have to learn what the world is like. And I call that the world of is, that which is. And that's what the scientist tries to understand. And one goes into that. But then, as you grow older, you realize further 
The world is, is, is not all that I have to talk about. The world is about not just me, but about all these people. But then that means the world is about everybody else and about me only to the extent that I'm part of their world. Yes. Now that is where wisdom starts. And once you get to that realization, you get a glimpse of the world of should be. I don't care whether the world that is, is, is the way it should be. I'm taking it separately. What should be? That which I can deem right by thinking about it myself. I know that it is right and if I have any doubts, I can always check if I replace myself by him and now say for him he does the same thing. If that is right, only then is it right for me. And what I see is right, will I accept it as right for him? If not, then it isn't right. Now these are the three worlds as I would look at them. The world of I want, and when you go to technology, you're trying to convert the world of is to the world by using the world of I want, to closer to what you want. But ultimately there must be the constraints of the world of should be. Sure, I may want to make a bomb that can explode be exploded on India and destroyed, should it be done? And clearly the answer is no. And it shouldn't be done, then I shouldn't be making the bomb. Now that is where constraints will come on understanding the, the world of his. Science is not about changing the world, it is about understanding. At this point, you'll find in Penrose and anywhere else. Now, perhaps you'll see my point about the secular knowledge and other knowledge. But let me say with scientific knowledge per se first. Scientific knowledge, the way that we think, there are theories that we formulate which try to give us an understanding of what we see. What, when we say an understanding, what we're saying is there are these assumptions. On the basis of these assumptions, we can make predictions and they will come out correct. Now, if they don't come out correct, we say that we have to force, we've falsified the theory. So the theory will not be proved true, it will be proved false only. Till it is proved false, we accept it is true. Therefore, that answers the question, any ultimate final answer, there won't be. There will always be some doubts and some questions, and there will be a better and better understanding, but never a complete understanding. Let me give an example with the universe as a whole. The universe as a whole, we understand very well now from about one hundredth of a second on to now. One hundredth of a second is very little when you compare it with 13.78 billion years. We understand it. And you could say there's only the one hundredth of a second left. But you see, who told me that I use this scale? Supposing I were to go to a logarithmic scale, 